Uh, so our first speaker today uh, will be Ralph Blumenhagen talking about Coverdism, K3, and Tadpoles. Okay. Thank you very much and giving me the opportunity to speak here for the organization of this wonderful workshop. So um, we have uh, now two talks on uh, robotism. So I will give the first one, which is more a bit of an introduction to get us on the same page. And then later on, Nicolo will give an online talk uh, on more advanced topics uh, related to uh, robotism. So what I will mainly do is to review uh, this paper I wrote uh, together with Nicolo appeared last year. And to give you a slight overview of what we did about generalized cobot, uh, sorry, uh, dynamical cobotism in this paper, also together with two students from Munich, Christian Kneisel and Andriana Mafidou. And then Nicolo uh, will give you more details on this, a bit more mathematical paper that we wrote recently. So that's the outline. So um, we have heard a couple of times already about this uh, famous con swampland conjecture that there are no global symmetries in quantum gravity. So if we are in a situation where we seem to detect one, we are not really in quantum gravity yet, so we do have to do something. So it actually needs to be gauged or broken. These are the two possibilities that we have. And for continuous symmetries, this means of course that the current either can be written as a total derivative of some gauge field or that the current is not preserved so that there's something appearing on the right-hand side here. Um, then it was pointed out in this nice paper by McNamara and Waffa that uh, non-vanishing cobordism groups are a source of such global symmetries and thus need to be nullified in, in, uh, in the final theory. And the question now is how to do that, how to approach um, that quantum gravity, uh, that cobordism group uh, with quantum gravity structure, which we don't know yet what this actually is. If we start with something that mathematicians know, which, is, which are, in general, including cases where the cobordism group is non-vanishing. Like for instance, the pure geometric things like the cobordism groups with structure spin manifolds or spin C manifolds. And these have been discussed also in this, in this paper and there were proposals um, both in various string theories like type one or type two, um, what kind of defects um, could break these symmetries. There was also a bit more recent paper on relating uh, the cobordism conjecture to the Ritchie flow by people also from Munich and Dieter in particular. Okay, so what is a cobordism in mathematics? So let's focus on some structure, but we can of course look at other structures. Say we want to define uh, the cobordism group the structure uh, spin. So these are equivalence classes of n-dimensional spin manifolds, m and n which we call equivalent if there is a one-dimensional higher manifold, also spin manifold, such that the boundary of that manifold is M um, um, connected to N bar. And N bar is the uh, manifold with the opposite orientation. This defines a group. This is what the mathematicians tell us. For instance, the addition is defined by the disjoint union of such manifolds. And let me just mention that these cobordism groups have also appeared prior to this advance uh, by McNamara and Waffer, for instance, in the discussion of anomalies, of these uh, day-free anomalies, for instance, by our chairman. Okay, so what in particular Nicolo will tell you more about is the generalization of these groups. Um, so far, we were just focusing on general n-dimensional manifolds with a certain structure, but you can be a bit more precise, so to say. So you can introduce, as we usually do in, in string theory, a background. And then you can define something like omega n of x. And the mathematical definition involves here, in this case, also um, a fixed manifold x. So we again have the same thing. So we have two uh, manifolds m and n. We want to connect them. But this time, we also have an embedding map of m into this fixed manifold x. And we would also like to transport this map here to the map on the other side. So everything has to work out, so to say. So there must then be definition of a map H on this uh, connecting manifold omega at W such that if you restrict it to the boundary, you get F, to M you get F and on and N you get G. And the former case uh, that we discussed more generally is just the case when X is a point. So this again introduces some background dependence where we thought that if we, uh, so to say, 
in string theory, we usually have a background dependence. But one of the advantages, of course, in introducing this concept of, of cobordism was that it's more or less background independent. So now, in some sense, we are going a step back from our initial goal to approach something that, uh, that, is, um, that is vanishing. But nevertheless, we think it's interesting to discuss these things just to sharpen our tools and to see that we understand really what, what is going on. Okay, so um, if you just compute or look at the table of uh, the cobordism groups that mathematicians have computed with structure uh, spin, you find this table here. So this is the dimension of the manifold and this is it's the group. So some things are already vanishing, but there are also factors that are non-vanishing, like this one here, for instance. And then there are also discrete groups like Z2 here. And note that here is also uh, Z2 plus Z. So you get certain groups twice. And, but if you now remember the K theory, the K O K theory groups, you get more or less the same table. So the line would be the same, only that here, Here's the first difference appearing. There's only a single factor of Z. I can do to the I can play the same game for spin C manifolds, uh, where you get these uh, cobordism groups here. Again, you have this proliferation of factors here already at four-dimensional manifolds. Uh, it's the same story here. The, the ordinary unitary K theory groups um, have Z factors for every even dimension. So just by naked eye, you think there must be a relation. And let me just mention that many things are known about these. Also, the generators uh, for these classes are known by concrete manifolds, and which I didn't write here, but here I wrote it. Also, um, you can define cobordism invariants, which are topological classes, which do not change inside a cobordism class. Yeah? Uh, so here they can express in terms of chain classes, but it's not that all chain classes of this degree are cobordism invariants. So this is the independent set of them. Okay, so there seems to be a relation just by naked eye. And indeed, if you look in the math literature, you will find that there is something known like that. And the question we wanted to ask, so we, which we addressed in this first paper was what is the physical significance of that? And this goes under the name of the Atiyah Bot Shapiro map or ring homomorphism to be more precise. So there is indeed a map, which is not one-to-one -one because you have seen that the cobordism groups are larger. There are these extra factors um, from, uh, for instance, omega spin C to the K theory groups and from uh, omega spin to the KO groups, to the formula groups. And the definition is such that for fixed grade, for fixed and n dimensional manifolds, uh, this very, um, sorry, this map is nothing else than the top class, which gives an integer. So, and for spin C, it's an integer. So here we had only integers. No, we have only integers, right? Yeah, only integers, no discrete groups. And here's a bit more complicated. So I didn't give you the table. I gave it in a prior talk. So, oh, this should not be a C, I'm sorry. So this is alpha here. So for uh, for spin manifolds, it's essentially the A roof genus. So it's the number of spinners on the manifold. Okay, so this map, can be is, is for first of all the cobordism invariant as it should be. It's subjective, so that one can divide by its kernel to get really an isomorphism. This is what mathematicians like. So there's an integrate relationship between the two, and both of them. So if you have a non-vanishing cobordism group, you are told we get numbers. So we have we have symmetries. We have global symmetries that we don't want to have. Uh, in K theory, the same story. We compute a non-vanishing K theory group, which is a D-brain, by the way. We get only its, its charge, yeah. So we have not really detected, so to say, the gauge field, or not include the gauge field in this computation. We just compute the charge. It's also on this level a global symmetry. So we need to do something with that. And it's known that in K theory, all global charges are expected to be gauged. This is what we know from string theory. No? So for the D brains, um, for instance, we know that there is in general a Ramon Ramon field such um, that the charge is gauged, that we get a generalized, or can we get a Yankee identity or field equation of this type? So this is the source here of the brains. But we know from string theory that this is usually called Yankee identity. And if you integrate it over a closed manifold, you get a tadpole equation, a tadpole cancellation condition. But we know, for instance, in type 2B or antifolds, that there are usually more terms than just the brains on the right-hand side appearing. So there are also these geometric things appearing, or there are O-planes appearing. And the proposal that, that we are doing is 
that this missing geometric piece is described by the corresponding cobalism group. So they are paired together and they both contribute to the same tadpole cancellation condition. That's our proposal. More precisely, these other things are given, this missing things are given by linear combinations of the cobalism invariants. That's our proposal, but we can check. Um, and we will show it like just for an example, or we discussed a lot in this paper, um, that for instance, omega spin describes the geometric contribution to the type one tadpole constraints and omega spin C describes um, the geometric contribution to the general type two B oriented folds or F theory tadpole constraints. Okay, just give you an example, spin C for instance. So we are talking about the K theory classes that are all integer here, it's gauged. So these are the D brains in type two B. Um, so then tot classes would be the natural currents but we know that if we have a proliferation of factors, Z factors in the cobaltism groups, we get more cobaltism invariants. And the claim is that we have to include in principle all of them on the right-hand side or in, in, in the tadpole cancellation condition. So one example is uh, take omega two spin C. So here um, the cobaltism invariant, and also the, the map here, up here, uh, is given by uh, the first Chern class essentially. So it's the second pot class, which is the first Chern class over two. And so if you write down this equation, it would look like this. So you have now the seven brains as sources. And the claim is that you have additional sources which are given by this uh, cobaltism invariant. So if you write it, when you, when you include here a factor of 24, you get precisely uh, what is known as the tadpole constraint in F theory. And you compact D phi F theory on a K3. Um, so here it matches, it looks, well, it's maybe not a very deep result. So you could say that it could just be an accident or so, but at least we have, first of all, there is the map between the two. So they should be play a role. So in physics, we think that um, in the process of gauging, they both combine to give the same, give contributions to the same tadpole. Now you can ask, what is the reason for this factor 24? Can I fix it? Well, that's an open problem, I would say still, to fix it from first principle. So you expect that it's sort of fixed by anomalies and so on, if you think about string theory, but it would be nicer to fix it directly just from cobaltism, the cobaltism formalism. And so here is just a normalization factor that we include by hand, but um, yeah, so this is an open problem. Maybe more convincing hopefully is if you look at six dimensional spin C manifolds. So here the cobaltism group is Z plus Z. So the gauging is to a D3 tadpole constraint. So here are uh, the usual D3 brains. And then we have two cobaltism invariants. This is the tot class. And then there's the second one, C1 to the third power over two. And here I introduce general uh, factors like the factor of 24. There is normalization factors here. And indeed, if you fix or choose this uh, factors to be these numbers here, then you get the familiar tadpole constraint of uh, F-theory compactifications on a color fourfold. And these are then the numbers for the base. So you can express um, the Euler number in terms, you know, this is the general thing that appears on the right-hand side for the D3 break tadpole. And you can express it in terms of the data on the base. And so precisely these two combinations appear. In principle, there's another one like C3 that doesn't appear, neither here nor in the cobalt invariance. So this is at least one consistency check for our claim. That's the C3 does not appear. And this extra, this new factor is related to the presence of O7 planes in general, in this case, if you would have a background that only has O3 planes, we claim, or we have evidence that then this term would be vanishing. So as, so to say the, um, the, the, um, the ABS map, the invariant you know, there, the top class is only appearing when you have, so to say, only the corresponding O plane of the same dimension, no other ones contributing, okay? Okay, so next step. Here it's a bit less clear. So if we gauge now one uh, of these torsion classes, so omega one spin, which was E2, um, then if you would naively play the same game, so you get a Z2 charge neutrality condition here, where you have contributions here from um, the eight brains, here the eight brains, and here's the corresponding um, cobaltism invariant. So then the question is, what's the value of K? So if, if K is even, 
well, because it's mod two here, everything, because it's C2 valued, then um, the cobordism group would completely decouple the right hand side here. And it would just be the K theory charge that would be gauged. And we still need to break um, the cobordism group by some defect or so. The other situation would be if K is odd, but that's even stranger. This is really strange. This would mean, for instance, that first of all, that the generator of um, the cobordism group, which is just an F S1 uh, is not a back, it's not an allowed background anymore, but that's certainly not true. But what would be an allowed background is if you put a single uh, non BPS V8 brain, um, it's a non BPS brain, maybe I didn't say that. So if you put the non BPS V8 brain on this is one, this would then be on an allowed background. So this is strange. So we think that in this case, K is really even, but we don't know whether this is sort of the generic situation that all torsion classes, so to say, all cobalt torsion classes eventually needs to be broken and they do not contribute to the TEPCO cancellation condition that we don't know yet. Okay, so let me move forward. Um, so we have seen that there are these generalizations of cobaltisms where we also talk about a background, a chosen background and define these classes here. And actually this map uh, generalizes to this case. This is known as the generalization of the corner Floyd theory in mathematics. So then you have a map, you can define a, an isomorphism even from this, uh, say, X valued uh, spin proposal groups to the KO or K theory groups on X. Yeah? So this is supposed to classify the right hand side brains wrapping certain cycles on the man. Uh, this is what their physical significance is. So it involves uh, these more these generalized um, cobordism groups. So we can ask, so how, how can we compute them? And what is their physical relevance in this problem program? And we have addressed this question in this recent paper from August. And this is really the, the um, contents of the talk by Nicolo. How much time do I have? Sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm well, I'm well done in time. Okay. Okay. So what I will talk about. Um, is now switch a bit uh, the contents. Uh, so I talk about something that was developed here in Madrid by by the group of Urang, uh, by the group of Angel and his students. And this is having a nice relation between very former work that we did and we and people did not really understand, so to say, and this new concept of uh, cobordisms. And this goes under the name of dynamical cobordisms. So this is now about breaking the global symmetry by 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 new defects. We would like to see what these defects are. Yeah? And dynamical means here that it's not just topological. Here we are really looking at supergravity equations of motion or Dillaton gravity equations of motions, finding solutions that look non trivial, but we could not really make sense of. But now, with this new idea of cobordism, we can make sense of it because these solutions generically had singularities and had finite sizes, um, involved spontaneous compactifications, and now the interpretation of these solutions is that indeed you can make them consistent by including these end of the world brains or defects. And in these papers, which I don't have the time to completely review here. So what they propose is if you have such a solution in your theory and you indeed find that a certain interval of your manifold becomes finite, when you approach that wall, yeah, the solution, you get a nice scaling behavior. Um, for instance, that the distance to the wall scales like e to the minus some number delta times um, a scalar field. Uh, so if you want to go to zero here, so approach the wall, a scalar field goes to infinity or minus infinity. And on the other side, there's a related scaling of the curvature close to the wall. So if you approach it, it scales like with the same coefficient here, just twice and a different sign, again, like the scalar field. So that's very nice. Uh, let me just mention for completeness that very recently that picture was also extended to time dependent backgrounds. So it seems to be a very generic features of some kind of solutions that we are seeing in string theory or in their supergravity or gra dilaton gravity approximation effective theory. So the question that we were addressing here in that paper is whether we can generalize this. So all these examples that were studied here involve uh, co-dimension co one defects. Yeah? So 
you have a solution of your equations of motion, which was not localized, but it certainly, so to say, by the solution, there was an end of the defect or singularity, and then you could put a defect there, which is co-dimension one relative to your starting point. So we wanted to generalize this um, to higher co-dimensions. And maybe that's the new aspect. We were, so here we start with some solution. Then you see, look how this solution approaches uh, what happens when you approach this supposed defect, then you compute the effectors delta and so on. But you can also ask another question. You can ask, is there also a description, supergravity or dilaton gravity of that solution, uh, sorry, of that end of the world brain itself, which is of course of higher, one co-dimension even higher, yeah? And this is what we also wanted to do. So this is the second question. So is there an explicit description of this ETD brain itself? And the model that we were looking at is a generalization of the dudas mora model, which is the same type. So it's essentially dilaton gravity. So here's the kinetic terms. And here they have a source, which in this case is, if you have the 10 dimensions here, is a, is a D8 brain, sort of an eight brain, thank you. It's an eight brain. Uh, it was quick five minutes, actually. <laughs> I don't want to in five minutes. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, okay, so we included here um, um, the source term here for this, uh, for this DA brain of positive tension and no charge. So it's neutral. So example is, for instance, if you would look at the back reaction of a non-BPS DA brain in type one, or what they had in more in mind, who does in Mura, is the Ramon Ramon a uh, tadpole free uh, configuration of uh, OA++ and 16 uh, anti D8 brains in a T-dual of the Sugimoto model. Yeah. And in this paper with Anna Maria, also in the audience here, we were looking at this solution uh, many years ago, 22 years ago, actually. And the solution was very similar to the Dudas Morad, was motivated by that. So indeed there was no maximal symmetric solution so there was no solution. Okay, so you have your, your eight brain here. So it's a nine-dimensional world volume. So there's no solution preserving um, the nine-dimensional Lorentz symmetry along these directions. So you have to have a certain dependence also to have a rolling solution. So that also depends on one of the longitudinal solutions. And we found two of them, two different cases, so to say. And one of them uh, had the topology of S1 cross an interval. So there was, first of all, a spontaneous compactification. So we didn't include S1 in the first case. So there was a spontaneous compactification and then an interval. So this sounds like, smells like end of the world stuff. Um, and indeed, this is like that. So there's an end of the world uh, object there. But at that time, we, there was an issue with uh, log singularities also along um, the transversal direction to the brain, which we couldn't really make sense of. They were highly, I mean, the, the, string, the string coupling was going to infinity at this position and so on. So the solution exists, but we couldn't really make physical sense out of it. But now it has a completely different interpretation because if there is an end of the world seven brain in this case, this is what we expect, well, it also needs to be localized in that direction. And this is where the Delaton goes to infinity. So. This is again indicating that there is an end of the world seven brain in this case. And so this is indeed the correct interpretation and it fits perfectly into this picture developed here in Madrid. So we found the scaling for instance here of the geometric distance and, and the curvature and we could fix this uh, number here. Okay, so next question is, what is the nature of this ETD seven brain? Can we describe it intrinsically also as a solution to the supergravity or dilaton gravity equations of motion. For in this case, the old solution, of course, still preserved the long, uh, still preserved the um, uh, Poincaré symmetry along the eight dimensions, where the fields do not depend on the single direction of finite size. So we expect this solution to still preserve now eight-dimensional Poincaré symmetry. So it's a seven-brain, so it's all these longitudinal directions should still be fine. It, we expect this has to it to be has log um, singularities close to its core. And it is a new aspect that if you look at the old solution, so to say, what its behavior was close to this, close to the end of the world brain, we expect actually the solution to be non-isotropic. So something is broken. And this is the, thank you, the rotational symmetry um, along the two, along the two um, tr transversal directions. So we made this uh, non-isotropic ansatz, went into the equations of motion, 
And um, indeed, we found uh, the equation of motion was very similar to the former case that um, we exist, there exists a solution to the bike equation with motion with precisely this log singularity. And so this was very convincing. Uh, so we have a description now also of this end of the world brain intrinsically. And we could also fix by matching with the delta source um, the action of that and in particular its tension and its um, tension in uh, Einstein frame looks like this, which means, so it's constant. In, there's no scaling uh, with the dilaton. So this means if you compute it back that in string frame, it scales like e to the minus two phi. So like closed string. Okay, so I cannot give you the full solution. It's in the paper, but maybe a plot tells more than hundred words here. So if you do a polar plot of that solution, so the quantities that we have, this is here, the warp factor in particular in this case, you find this picture. So these are two solutions. We have two independent solutions. One is looking like this and one is looking like this. So there's a certain symmetry. And now I tell you, this looks really like an end of the world brain, right? So the brain is sitting here. In this direction, space completely disappears. There's nothing. And then there's a non-trivial profile here in all the other angular directions. So I think this is very suggestive. And indeed, if you look at this solution, it, it gives you the same scaling behavior, the factor of delta, if you move close to the brain. So that's a perfect match. Okay, still some open issues here. Um, so this was for our second solution in the paper. We had two solutions, and the other one didn't have end of the world brains. So it's just uh, one minute, okay? It, it's just S1 cross, um, cross R. So there's, it's not a finite size. So you're not really expecting end of the world brain. So, but you have still the log singularity. You have a log singularity in the other direction. So what is this meaning? So it does not seem to be a consistent solution. So either it's just an accident, so it's unstable in decays, or maybe it's related to the gauging instead of breaking. So that this solution cannot be repaired by an end of the world brain. So it needs to be gauged, which, would which you would expect to happen. Remember, so I gave you two examples realizations of this setup. One was the non bps SDA brain, which we expect to be gauged uh, and cannot be cured by defects. So maybe this is related um, to, to the second, to the two po really possible realizations of such a, um, um, effective action in dilaton gravity. Okay, what we are now looking at is a generalization of this picture. So to construct explicitly the end of the world solutions, partly for solutions that were already done, or constructed or seen in indirectly, I would say, uh, here by the Madrid group. For instance, we also constructed um, the end of the world solution uh, for the Dudas Mora model. And this will be shown in, in this upcoming paper here. Um, and this is all I wanted to say. So let me summarize. So the claim is that the gauging leads to tadpole cancellation conditions known from oriented fault and F theory. K theory and cobordisms are combined in these equations. K theory provides the brain charges and the cobordism the geometric contributions to the tadpole cancellation conditions. Um, moreover, in the second part, I told you that dynamical cobordism provide a gravity dilaton supergravity description of the end of the world brains. There are still open questions. We have not really looked at type 2A. Maybe one should do this more uh, certain issues with type 2A, but um, um, like an M theory, for instance, that uh, the structure is non-oriented, so the non-oriented uh, cobordisms enter. So, but this has not really been worked out yet. Um, but we, I mean, we, we are starting at the wrong place. That's pretty clear. We don't, we don't, we, we didn't start at the place where all cobordism groups are vanishing, which we should actually do. So, we would like to approach it, and maybe in this also fix these coefficients and the tadpole cancellation condition. So, it would be nice to have a formalism to compute, for instance. Um, Cobalism groups, which also have a gauge field, these Ramon Ramon gauge fields, and include the defects. Whatever this object is, is not defined in some sense yet. Yeah. But this is the thing you should compute. And maybe when you then run a spectral sequence, sort of, then you see that all things come nicely together and you also see this factor of 24. This would be a possibility. Um, okay, so this, I think these two questions are probably related. And finally, let me just mention um, what we also. At the end, would like to see whether if we just do this bottom up thing of cobordisms and say start with spin C or spin and move it up to the quantum gravity uh, structure, is this unique? And is this precisely the one that we see in string theory in 10 dimensions or 11 dimensions? 
So this is completely um, not settled yet. There were some approaches by this um, paper by by uh, David and also Nicolo. Yields. But um, yeah, this is what I wanted to tell you. Thank you. Hey, thanks for the nice talk, uh, Ralph. Any questions? Uh, Sandro? Yeah. So when one looks for supergravity solutions, one often finds um, formal solutions where the, there is a singularity, where the fields behave in a certain way with fractional powers. And if I personally, if I cannot match them to a known uh, brain behavior, yes. I throw them away because I'm not actually solving the equations of motion for supergravity plus localized objects, localized objects which are known to exist. And so I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so I'm a little confused if you are uh, here suggesting that you found some, so the end of the world, eight brain, seven brain, even, even do that's more up, um, look a bit confusing to me. Why is that? Well, because that, do we have independent evidence? It's not for the existence of these objects. Otherwise, it's not. No, I can revisit uh, many, many uh, computations of mine and publish many papers now saying, oh, wait a second. I have these new solutions with uh, this singularity and this other singularity. And this other. But I don't think it would be quite correct because I don't know what equations of motion would that I would be solving do you see what i mean so in the in the ordinary case what we are solving is i mean when we see that uh, we find a solution where there's a singularity that we can match to a um, to a brain we we can infer quite reasonably that we are solving the equations of motion for the bulk equations plus the localized terms that we know and love from i don't know the dbi plus Jim Simons yeah for the for the brains here do you have uh, can you give independent evidence that there is such an object with a localized action? I, I can even- maybe I, I'm not completely understanding your question, but- You don't understand that. I even, no, no, maybe I, I, I even recall an occasion where I was attacked because I only matched the leading behavior of my solution to a known- Well, this is not uh, leading behavior. Or plane, and I, not the, also the sub leading behavior. Now it turns out that I, but well, this is not, well, of course, it's it's just the, the truncation of effective theory to this level, right? This equation you are solving exactly. So what, what Dudas Mora did, Dudas Mora, I mean, look at Dudas Mora first. Okay, so what they did, they, they don't have this localized, I mean, they didn't have any source, we just think. Um, no, they, they, did, they just have a um, similar term here, but without this delta. So they were looking at a solution to, um, yeah, to, 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 to a nine brain actually, to a nine brain that is sitting with positive tension in space. And then they solve the equations and they realize that there is sort of, they cannot find a solution that preserves the full 10 dimensional Lorentz or Poincare symmetry. Uh, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, so they, they made a different answers. So they compactified or let, let all the fields depend on one of these longitudinal directions. And then they found a solution. But this solution was special in the sense that in this that the size of this extra of this longitudinal dimension came out to be finite. That's that's the solution. I none, think. none of that yeah. that doesn't worry me too much. We have a similar behavior for the D8 in uh, massive two A, and that, uh, no one complains. But uh, uh, for every such case, do you have, uh, look, for example, well, may, maybe it's my ignorance, but uh, the, uh, is there an independent justification for that uh, particular localized action? So for example, here, non-BPS D8 brain of type one. So, um, no, okay, for the D8 brain, I, I think I- It's I the non-BPS D8 about, brain. But in, uh, sorry? This is a non-BPS D8 brain, only carries, only has tension, positive tension and, and no charge. So what so they're saying is, the, is, for all these cases, can you exhibit uh, the, um, independent, can you give independent reasons to believe the localized action? Or did you, what, what, or I, did you only what, infer what, it from the want. solution? This I think it's a well justified act, it's a well justified action. I mean, what else would you would like to write? Well, they, 
localized maybe, action for the brains comes from the open stream. Maybe right. maybe it's time to keep the the to keep this discussion offline, perhaps, yeah. because we need to move on. I maybe see I'm that not... my question wasn't even clear. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so unless there's some very quick question, uh, I think we should thank Ralph again. Thanks.